نحمده و نسلی علی رسوله الكریم اعوذ بالله من الشیطان الرجیم بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فكهنا في الدين اللهم الهمنا رشدا وعزنا من شرور انفسنا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته was 42 had it been an easy gain and a moderate trip the hypocrites would have followed you but distant to them was the journey and they will swear by allah if we were able we would have gone forth with you destroying themselves through false oaths and allah knows that indeed they are liars so what traits of hypocrites do we learn from here is that they are liars and they make false oaths and they do not want to strive or struggle in jihad for the path of allah so uh, i've already mentioned what the hardships of uh, the tabuk expeditions were uh, uh, tabuk expeditions were and these uh, hardships were, were were the actual factors which were deterrent for the for the hypocrites to proceed for the expedition may allah pardon you why did you give them permission to remain behind actually what happened was that when the hypocrites they came up with their uh, with their lies and with their false excuses to give them permission to stay behind prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was actually he never made bad assumptions and he was soft hearted and he was very kind and merciful so very kindly and very graciously he used to in good intentions and in good faith he used to accept their excuses not la- labeling and not assuming them to be liars in good faith so he used to give them and grant them permissions to stay behind so this is what allah subhanahu wa taala has commented here why did you give them permissions to re- uh, to remain behind you should not have until it was evident to you who was truthful and you knew who were the liars this was why because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to uncover the hypocrisy of all the hypocrites those who believe in allah and the last day would not ask permission of you to be excused for striving with their wealth and their lives and allah is knowing of those who fear him only those would ask permission of you who do not believe in allah and the last day and whose hearts have doubted and they in their doubt are hesitant and if they had intended to go forth they would have prepared for it some preparations but allah disliked their being sent so he kept them back and they were told remain behind with those who remain so continuously we realize that how allah subhanahu wa taala is commenting on his dislike of the behavior the false the lying behavior of the hypocrites had they gone forth with you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also consoling that you didn't need the company of all these hypocrites. Allah says, had they who, the hypocrites, they gone forth with you, they would not have increased you except in confusion and they would have been active among you seeking to cause you fitna and among you are avid listeners to them and allah is knowing of the wrong doers so allah is saying that it is better for the muslim army that it was not joined by all the hypocrites of medina they had already desired dissension before and had upset matters for you until the truth came and the ordinance of allah appeared while they were averse verse 49 and among them is he who says permit me to remain at home and do not put me to trial unquestionably into trial they have fallen and indeed hell will encompass the disbelievers now this verse is regarding a hypocrite whose name was jad bin kes he came out with a lame and also an immoral excuse 
he was saying that whenever he explained to Prophet Sallallahu that whenever he saw a beautiful lady, he lost his self-control and could not resist. And that he had heard that the Roman women would like beauties. So he asked Prophet Sallallahu to kindly let him stay behind for if he went to the Tabuk expedition and he got and he got sight of the beautiful Roman ladies, he might get tempted and he might indulge in some form of immoral activities. And this might turn out as a trial for him, as a temptation for him. So Allah has commented that unquestionably, he already in, has fallen into a trial. If good befalls you, it distresses them. But if disaster strikes you, they say, we took our matter in our hands before and they turn away while they are rejoicing. Say, never will we be struck except by Allah has decreed for us. He is our protector and upon Allah, let the believers rely. Say, do you wait for us except one of the two best things? Actually, what the hypocrites of Medina and even the Jews in all this scenario, they were thinking and they were believing and imagining and assuming. And in fact, they were rejoicing that here, a brief army of the Muslims, when they will go to fight and face a huge army of the superpower, the Romans, they will be destroyed and they will be perished and none of them will remain. And they were rejoicing actually in their hearts that Medina will be to, to the hypocrites all over again also. And the leader of the hypocrites, Abdullah bin Awai, was also very happy that he will be made as the leader of Medina again. So to answer this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that you tell them that are you awaiting for us except one of the two best things? While we await for you that Allah will afflict you with punishment from himself or at our hands. So wait, indeed we need, indeed we along with you are waiting. Say, spend willingly or unwillingly, never will it be ex accepted from you. From whom? The hypocrites. Indeed, you have been a defiantly disobedient people. Now, why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning that all which has been spent by the hypocrites for the purpose of jihad will not be acceptable? Allah says that whatever the hypocrites will spend for the cause of jihad will not be accepted by Allah. What was all this about? Because you know that they, without any actual excuse, Without any actual and real excuse, they were disobeying Allah and Prophet for not accompanying the army for the Tabu expedition. Since it was made obligatory, they were supposed to go. They did not have any excuse. Now to cover up or to justify their disobedience or as like an alternative, they were offering money for the purpose of jihad. So why? So that their share would be added up in some form or the other, and their hypocrisy would not be revealed or highlighted. So Allah refused accepting it, showing what? Showing the dislike and showing the punishment of hypocrites that their spending in the path of Allah also goes unaccepted. This is hypocrisy. And this is the punishment of the hypoc hypocrites that whatever they spend for the purpose of jihad or whatever they spend in the path of Allah as charity will not be accepted by Allah and they will not be rewarded for this deed. So we need to realize that those in Medina, who are they? Who are these people who have been commented like this? These were the people in Medina who had embraced Islam. They used to offer congregational salah in the mosque five times a day. And now they are spending for the purpose of jihad. They were just not accompanying Prophet wasallam physically for jihad. And they are being labeled as hypocrites. 
This is exactly what Prophet Sallallahu has been reported. In a tradition, Prophet Sallallahu said, a person who neither does jihad or has a desire to struggle for jihad dies in a state of hypocrisy. Allahumma la taj'alla minhum. Allahumma tawhir qalbi min al-nifaki wa amali min al-riyai wa lisani min al-qazabi wa aini min al-khayanati. So remember, this is hypocrisy. Announcing to embrace Islam, offering just not salah at home, but even at congregational salah in the mosque, spending in the path of jihad also, spending charity in the path of Allah also, and still being labeled as hypocrites. This is the importance of jihad struggling for the teaching, for the preaching, for the implementation, for the protection fighting for the cause of Allah. And what prevents their expenditures from being accepted from them, but that they have disbelieved in Allah and his messenger and that they came, they did that they came not to pray except while they are lazy and they do not spend except while they are unwilling. So let not their wealth or their children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously commenting about the state of affairs and the punishments of the hypocrites. Let not their wealth or their children impress you. Allah only intends to punish them through them in worldly life and that their souls should depart at death while they are disbelievers. And they swear by Allah that they are from among you while they are not from among you, but they are people people who are afraid if they could find a refuge or some caves or any place to enter and hide they would turn to it while they run heedlessly and among them are some who criticize you among concerning uh, criticize you concerning the distribution of charities if they are given from them they approve but if they are not given from them at once they become angry Verse 59, if only they had been satisfied with what Allah and his messenger gave them and said, sufficient for, what, for us is Allah. Allah will give us of his bounty and so will his messenger. Indeed, we are desirous towards Allah. It would have been better for them. So in this verse number 40, uh, 40, uh, in this verse number 59 and 58, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning another behavior of the hypocrites. That when the hypocrites, they were not given out of the charity, they would criticize Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for being unfair and for doing injustice. So to put an end to all this criticism of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam regarding the distribution of zakat and the distribution of the money of charity, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala decided and clearly announced in the next verse all the places and all the causes where zakat was to be allocated. Allah is talking about where to spend out the obligatory <clears throat> the obligatory sadaqat, that is zakat. As the word in the verse number 60, Allah is mentioning faridatam min Allah, an obligation placed from Allah clearly proves that in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to highlight and explain and narrate the purposes for which the money or all the things of the zakat can be spent. Allah says, Zakat expenditures are only for the poor and for the needy and for those employed to collect zakat and for bringing hearts together for Islam and for freeing the captives or slaves and for those in debt and for the cause of Allah and for the stranded travelers what is this? An obligation imposed by Allah, and Allah is knowing and wise. <clears throat> At the start of the verse, Allah says, Inna 
enema means that there is absolutely no doubt. There is absolutely no doubt. Or it means that for sure, the only, only allocations for the obligatory sadaqat or zakat are what? Which are explained clearly in the verse. So the obligatory sadaqat or the obligatory sadaqat will be allocated the first priority, wal fuqara, and the second is wal masakin, the poor and the needy. What do we mean by this? Who do we mean by this? And who comes up to the level of this category? I will be giving a few working conditions and a few working definitions so that it might be very easy for us to decide that whom around us is going to fall in the category of faqir and maskeen and is thus uh, is worthy of receiving the zakat which we are going to spend. So the faqir and maskeen will be all people who might be earning, but they spend what they earn. And hence, they have no saving in their kitty for any unforeseen calamity or any crisis or any economic situation in which they have economic uh, problem and they have an issue to be resolved, but they do not have anything in their kitty to carry on all that. Then they also are all those who are earning. They might be having some basic amenities, like they might be having a TV, a washing machine, a small refrigerator in their house. But despite having all this, they still do not manage to fulfill their basic necessities of life. Like there, there may be conditions that they will not be able to buy the winter clothing, or they might be running short of the food or the provisions. They might not be able to, under certain condition, buy a medicine for his sick mother or buy books for their children of school. So despite having certain things of normal day-to-day -day amenities, which might make us think that they are not poor and they are not needy, they happen to have TVs and they have to have a simple washing machine in their house. But yes, if they still cannot manage to fulfill the basic necessities of their life and they cannot make both ends meet, they still come up into the category of the fakir and the maskeen. Then fakir and maskeen will be all those we will label all those as the category of fakir and maskeen, those who cannot afford to spend, even to take out or to maintain the standard of living of the low middle class of the society. They can't even afford treating, getting treated their mother or their wife in a government hospital in a state hospital, can't even afford to teach their, their, their children in a state school or a government school. So all such poor and needy who, who cannot even come up to this economic standard, they are deserving of receiving zakat. And uh, the difference between fakir and maskeen is, fakir is a person who actually begs and asks for, whereas in contrast to that, a maskeen is a respectable, needy person who doesn't cling and who doesn't ask and who doesn't explain his economic problems and doesn't beg for things. The next category is Amelina Aleha. In an Islamic state, to run the system of zakat, and to implement the order of Allah regarding zakat, there has to be a department. There has to be a department, an organization with people who conduct and who implement the system of zakat. And they are the amilin of zakat, the people who gather and who procure the zakat from the people. So to fulfill the expenditures and to give the wages of all these amilin, zakat can be spent. And this is the third purpose of spending zakat on. And then for doing what? For bringing hearts together for Islam, for attracting people towards Islam. This can be done and has to be done at the state level, but not by individual level that uh, I like cannot spend zakat 
to my Christian maid or to my Jew servant to attract them towards Islam. This cannot be done at the individual or at the family level, but has to be done at the state level. The next uh, is what? Wafir Rikab for freeing up the slaves and the captives. What I mean is to pay off the debt. Any person who is indebted and cannot pay off his debt, then it can be uh, provided, provided the debt was taken for a permissible, for a lawful cause. And despite the person paying off all his wealth and money still stays indebted, then for such a legally lawful, permissible purposes, if a debt was taken, then to pay it off, uh, zakat can be used. And then fi sabilillah. And the path of Allah means for the teaching, all the money which is needed for teaching, for the preparation, for the preaching, for the implementation of the teachings of Quran, and for the propagation, and also for the cause of jihad, for helping the struggle of the mujahideen of Islam, zakat can be spread. And for whom? for the stranded traveler, a person who in a condition of travel becomes stranded and becomes an, an economic crisis strikes him, despite the fact that in his own place, he is affluent and he is affording, but because of the hardship of travel, he has become stranded that even on this person, zakat can be spent. Now, talking in brief about some orders and uh, some laws of zakat, we, know, we learn that zakat is a pillar of Islam. It is a basic pillar of uh, Islam, as has been reported by Hazrat Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Buni al-Islam ala khamsin. Buni al-Islam ala khamsin. That is, the pillars of Islam, the foundation of Islam has been laid on five pillars. And out of these five pillars, one is what? Atu zakata, paying of zakat. Remember, 70 times in Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned together of salah and zakat. Akimu salata wa atu zakata is mentioned in Quran 70 times. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly has ordered and mentioned in Quran in a verse saying, Allazina la yuktuna zakata wa hum bil akhiratihum kafirun. That all those who do not pay their obligatory zakat, they are as if they are disbelievers of the day of judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has labeled here in this verse, those people who do not or who default paying of their zakat as disbelievers. It is obligatory to pay zakat by all the adult men and women in whose position a certain limit of wealth has stayed over the year. And this limit of wealth, which is uh, which has to be possessed by the person or the master is known as the nisab. Now, talking about the percentage of zakat and the nisab of zakat for various wealths and riches, for various wealths and various forms of riches is like for gold. The gold, the nisab, and the cutoff value of weight of gold is seven and a half tolas or 87 grams weight of gold is the cutoff weight of gold. If someone has 87 grams or even one gram more than 87 grams of gold throughout the year in his or her position, then the person will have to pay two and a half person of two and a half person of zakat on what? on the saleable, on the price of the saleable weight of gold. Remember, it is not the weight of the gold we bought. Why? Because when we go to sell the gold, the weight of the gold is much lesser than the weight what which we bought to. So to calculate the zakat for the gold is, we need to see that if the weight of the gold we possess is more than 87 grams, may it be even more one gram more than that. And also remember, 
if the weight is one gram more, we do not, we don't have to pay zakat on just one gram. Then we are at a higher income slab. <coughs> And we have to pay zakat on all the 88 grams. And if the weight of the saleable goat exceeds more than 88 grams, then the sale price of, according to the current rate of gold will be estimated. And two and a half percent of the sale price of the saleable weight of gold will be paid in form of zakat once a year. Regarding silver, the nisab or the cut off value is 52 tolas, which comes up to 612 grams of silver. And then regarding cash, if the cash, may it be dollars or liras or whatever form of currency, if the value of the cash exceeds the price of 87 grams of gold, and this amount of cash or currency stays in the possession of the master over the year, that throughout the year, this amount of cash was in the account or was in, was with the possession of the person, then the person will be paying two and a half percent of the total cash as zakat. As far as the trade and business is concerned, nothing will be paid out of the cost of the land, like if a person has a shop or a person has a personal plaza, then nothing is payable as a card for the cost of the land, the cost of the construction, the cost of the furnishing, but just on the saleable price, on the saleable price of the saleable goods. Is the person expected and supposed to pay two and a half person of two and a half percent of the saleable price of the saleable goods once a year. Similar is the case with all forms of industries and factories that there will be nothing payable on the land of the factory, on the machinery, on the building, and not even on the raw material which is in the stores. But the only amount of zakat which has to be paid is on the products of the factory. On the products of the factory, their sale price is estimated and calculated and two and a half person, two and a half percent of the sale price will be paid as zakat once a year. Regarding the real estate, all the land or the plots which were purchased for personal use or for the family purposes, uh, for the family purposes, no zakat is obligatory. But if the person has bought a piece of land or a plot for business purposes or for the purpose of real estate investment, then there are two opinions regarding the zakat. Either, either the person will pay two and a half percent of the sale price every year. Assuming what? Like the orders for trade and for business, because this is a business investment. And the other opinion is that the person, since the plot, it is there and it is not generating money and it is not actually hot current cash. So the other opinion by some scholars is that for such a real estate investment, the person is not supposed to pay every year, but at the time when the person makes a deal and at the time the person sells this piece of land, then the person is supposed to pay two and a half percent of the sale price of the plot, not at the cost price of the plot, but at the sale price of the plot at the time of sale, two and a half percent, uh, percent of the price will be paid. And this relates to the agricultural zakat, which is an order for the zakat of the agricultural yeast, uh, agricultural yields. Regarding the agricultural zakat, which is also known as usher, this is this has to be paid contrary to the rest of the zakat, as Allah has said in the Quran, at the time of the yield of the crops. May it be once, may it be twice, may it be thrice. Whenever there is, the farmer receives the yield of the crop, he is supposed to pay the zakat. 
and if the uh, the yield exceeds a weight of five wasak, which is equal to 725 kilogr kilograms, then only will the farmer be pay. He will pay from within the yield itself. And the percentage of the zakat is also different. The percentage for a naturally irrigated land, like a land which is irrigated naturally by rainwater, since the overheads are not that colossal, so the percentage fixed by Allah and Prophet is 10% or it is one-tenth of the yield. But in contrast to that, a land which is artificially irrigated, like by the river water or by the streams or by any other artificial means or by tube wells, since the cost and the overheads uh, are greater as compared to a naturally irrigated land, the percentage of zakat will be 1 20th or it will be 5% of the total yield, provided the yield is exceeding 725 kilogra kilograms and it is to be given when at the time of the crop or at the time of harvesting the crop. Similarly, animals like camels, cows, goats also, if their number exceeds beyond a certain number, it is obligatory to pay zakat in form of the animal itself. No zakat, on commodities of personal use and zakat cannot be given to the non-Muslims or to the people of the book. And the descendants of Prophet Sallallahu can also not receive zakat. So these were uh, basic orders and rules and regulations in summary. And among them are those who abuse Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and they say he is an heir, meaning what? That he is very lighthearted and he is kind and he is soft, uh, soft hearted and merciful and forgiving. Say it is an heir of goodness for you that you that believes in Allah and believes and believes the believers, and he is a mercy to those who believe among you and those who abuse the messenger of Allah for them is a painful punishment. They swear by Allah to you Muslims to satisfy you, but Allah and his messengers are more worthy for them to satisfy if they should be believers. Do they not know that whoever opposes Allah and his messenger, that for him is the fire of hell wherein he will abide eternally. That is the greatest disgrace. They Hypocrites are apprehensive lest a surah be revealed about them, informing them whom the Muslims and Prophet وسلم, informing them of what is in their hearts, say, mock as you wish. Indeed, Allah will expose that which you fear. Now, this verse has a reference to context with an event which took place while the preparations for the Tabuk expedition were in progress. What happened was that a she camel of Prophet ﷺ went astray and was lost. So Prophet ﷺ sent the companions to look for it. They went searching, but they could not find it and they could not locate it. So you know what the hypocrites came out with? The hypocrites started making fun of it and they would mock. And they, in their own gatherings, they said that, look, these Muslims, they can't even search a lost camel. And under these state of affairs, they are planning to fight and have war with the Romans. Now, this comment of the hypocrites was revealed to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Actually, they knowing the powers and all the manners of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with Prophet وسلم, they were fearing that they have commented and they have mocked, but they were fearing that this might be revealed to Prophet وسلم, and the whole story and their secret conversation might be informed. And that is exactly what happened. And Allah said, if you ask them, they will surely say, we were conversing and we were playing. Say, is it Allah? and his verses and his messenger that you were mocking, make no excuses. You have disbelieved after your faith. And if we pardon you, if we pardon one faction of you, we will punish another faction because they are criminals. Verse 67, the hypocrite men 
and the hypocrite women are of one another. They are what? They are part and parcel. They are companions and they are supporters and helpers of each other. And what are their traits? What are their manners? They enjoin what is wrong and they forbid what is right and they close their hands. That is, they do not spend willingly in the path of Allah. They do not give charity. They have forgotten Allah. So he has forgotten them accordingly. Indeed, the hypocrites, it is they who are defiantly disobedient. Allah has promised the hypocrite men and the hypocrite women and the disbelievers the fire of hell. So you see here the punishment of hypocrites is the fire of hell being, being mentioned before the disbelievers. And Allah mentions wherein, where, where, in the fire of hell, wherein they will abide eternally. It is sufficient for them and Allah has cursed them and for them is an enduring punishment. You disbelievers, here Allah is labeling disbelievers as whom the hypocrites. You disbelievers are like those before you. They were stronger than you in power and more abundant in wealth and children. They enjoyed their portion of worldly enjoyment and you have enjoyed your portion as before you enjoyed their portion and you have engaged in vanities like that in which they engaged. It is those whose deeds have become worthless in this world and in hereafter and it is they who are the losers. Has there not reached them the news of those before them? The people of Nu and the tribes of Ag and Samud and the people of Ibrahim and the companions of Madian and the towns overturned. Their messengers came to them with clear proofs and Allah would never have wronged them, but they were wronging themselves. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is continuously jolting and giving warnings to those who were disbelievers. And here the disbelievers were those who were staying back, who were staying back, not performing jihad, despite not having a real and a true excuse. Verse number 71 now, in contrast to the hypocrites, the behavior and the traits and the manners of the believers, the believing men and the believing women are allies of one another. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. They enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong and they establish prayer and they give zakat and they obey Allah and his messengers. Those Allah will have mercy upon. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. Allah has promised the believing men and the believing women gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide eternally and pleasant dwellings in the gardens of perpetual residence. But approval from Allah is greater. It is that which is the greatest attainment. So do what? After explaining all the traits of the hypocrites and the believers, Allah hears orders us to do what? O Prophet وسلم, fight against the disbelievers and hypocrites be harsh upon them and their refuge is hell and wretched is the destination. So here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing all the Muslims and the Muslim states individually, personally, and at the state country level also, two behaviors. Regarding the disbelievers, fighting against the disbelievers and regarding the hypocrites to be harsh upon them. Because, you know, in Medina, the hypocrites, they were creating malice. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed the Muslim communities regarding their dealing with the local hypocrites till this order is till the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that be harsh with the hypocrites who are staying within a Muslim locality and a community. What, what does it mean by being harsh? Is It implies, we learn from commentaries, is that they should not be given any form of power, post, position, or designation in, this, in the community or society. And secondly, their, their witnesses and their evidences should not be accepted as far as the legal affairs of the state is concerned. 
they swear by Allah that they did not say anything against the Prophet while they had said the words of disbelief and disbelief of disbelief and they had disbelieved after their pretense of Islam and planned that which they were not to attain. They had planned, Nauzubillah, the assassination of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he came back on uh, after the Tabuk expedition. And they were not resentful except for the fact that Allah and his messenger had enriched them of his bounty. So if they repent, it is better for them. But if they turn away, Allah will punish them with a painful punishment in this world and hereafter and there will not be for them on the earth any protector or helper and among them are those who made a covenant with Allah saying if he should give us from his bounty we will surely spend in charity and we will be among the righteous now this verse number 75 till 77 in these three verses allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the event regarding a person in the period of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he requested uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to supplicate that he may become he may become wealthy and he may be blessed with wealth and riches from allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he asked prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to supplicate Prophet ﷺ warned him and he said that wealth and riches are a trial and they are a fitna. fitna. But he insisted. And Prophet ﷺ again warned him of the malice of um, richness and all the uh, of all the wealth. But then he said that he wanted to become wealthy and he wanted to become affluent so that he had affordability to spend charity in the path of Allah. So this was it. This made Prophet Sallallahu it convinced Prophet Sallallahu and then he made dua. And obviously it was the dua of the beloved of Allah and it was accepted. Now the person, he had, he had sheep and he had goats. And so with the supplication of Prophet Sallallahu being heard, the sheep and the goat, they started multiplying and they increased in number. They increased in number, hence his commitments and his time and his involvements, they also increased. Previously, he used to go for the congregational salah in the mosque of Medina five times. But now since he became more involved and he became busy and he, his commitments in time increased, so he started skipping and he started leaving and avoiding the congregational salah in the mosque. Now slowly and steadily the number of the livestock increased further and it increased to the extent that it became difficult for him to stay in Medina and he had to shift out to the outskirts of Medina to accommodate the increasing of the livestock. So now after this shifting from Medina he started omitting the Medina, the Friday congregational salah also which till now he was attending. So one after the other, things were going out. The worships were going out. This is what? fitna. And this is what? The love of money, the lust and the desire of the wealthy, which is, is what derails the person, makes the person go astray. Allahumma ihdina sirat al mustaqim. Allahumma inni as'aluka hubbaka wa hubba man yuhibbuka wa amal al lazi yuballiguni hubbaka. Now, finally, what happened was that finally, by the order of the Allah, the zakat collector, uh, by the order of Prophet, وسلم, he sent the zakat collector to come to him and take the zakat of his goat. But um, he, out of the love of his wealth and his richness, all his riches, he had turned into a miser. And out of the stinginess, he simply, he bluntly refused to pay the zakat for his goat. Prophet Sallallahu when he heard this, he was furious and he was angry. And uh, uh, the, these three verses of Surah Tawbah were also revealed. And when Prophet Sallallahu uh, heard this, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has said that, 
his zakat will not be accepted. What happened was that when these verses reached this person, he regretted and he was uh, he came to Prophet Sallallahu to offer his zakat. But since Allah had clearly highlighted and announced that his spending in the path of Allah will now not be accepted. So Prophet Sallallahu also refused and he did not accept it. And then we learn that uh, this person kept on coming in the caliphate in the period of Hazrat Abu Talib, uh, Hazrat Abu Bakr anhu, and Hazrat Umar anhu. but since Allah had refused and Prophet Sallallahu had refused, they also kept on refusing and his zakat was then not accepted. This is what? This is hypocrisy. And this is hypocrisy which comes in when? Which sets in when? When there is excessive love of love of love, of money, of riches, of wealth. Allah comments about him, but when he gave them from his bounty, they were stingy with it and turned away while they refused. So he penalized them with hypocrisy in their hearts until the day they will meet him because they failed Allah. <coughs> They failed Allah in what they promised him and because they habitually used to lie. Verse 78, did they not know that Allah knows their secrets and their private conversations and that Allah is the knower of the unseen? Verse 79, those who criticize the contributors among the believers concerning their charities and criticize the ones who find nothing to spend except their effort. So they ridicule them. Allah will ridicule them and they will have a painful punishment. Now this verse was reversed regarding a very sincere companion of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Hazrat Abu Aqil radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He was poor. And uh, he, uh, Prophet Sallallahu when he had asked for, uh, he had asked the people to spend charity for the, for jihad and for the expenditure of the Mujahideen and the army, then the companions, they were, they used to bring all the things and their wealth and everything. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu used to be so pleased. He used to pray for them. And like we've just learned that he gave them the glad tidings of Jannah. Hazrat Aqeel radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he was present there and when he used to see Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam give them glad tidings of Jannah, he had, he developed a deep desire and he used to wish that if he had money, he would be one of those lucky ones also. But remember, just these companions, they were full, full of actions. They would just not sit in despair. So instead of just sitting and just uh, uh, wailing and just being in despair and saying, oh, I wish, I regret if I had money, I could have spent and I could have come up to this level myself. No, instead he found al alternative situations. He found alternative solutions to the problem for his desire. And what he did was that he worked at a Jew's place, laboring all the night to draw the water from the well and working all the night, what he got was, he got about two to three kilos, as the words of the Hadith says, he got one sa of dates, which is almost like about two to two and a half kg of dates as his labor wages. And uh, since there was no food at home also, so he left half of the dates for the family and he brought the rest to donate for the jihad, for the purpose of jihad. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam appreciated what he spent so much that he spread the dates over all the things. And then Allah, Shakiran Alima, the Rabb, he revealed these verses to acknowledge and to appreciate the deed, the spending of Hazrat Abu Aqil radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Remember, it is not just the quality which Allah, the quantity which Allah sees, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is seeing the quality of the deed which has been spent in the path of Allah. The quality, the sincerity, the sacrifice and the intentions is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps in mind. And when um, Hazrat Abu Aqil, he brought all this small amount of dates, the hypocrites, they mocked him and they made fun of him. And uh, they were saying that, look at him, look at him. 
He has just come and he plans and he intends to fight the Romans with a handful of dates. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala liked his sacrifice and liked what he did. He liked it so much and he disliked the criticism of the hypocrites to that extent that for both the categories, a verse was revealed commenting on the behavior of both. So that is what Allah said, that those who criticize the contributors among the believers concerning their charities and criticize the one who find nothing to spend other than the effort, they ridiculed them. So Allah said, Allah will mock and ridicule those who ridiculed such sincere companions. Verse number 80, ask forgiveness for them or do not ask forgiveness for them. If you should ask forgiveness from them, even 70 times, never will Allah forgive them. That is because they disbelieved in Allah and his messenger and Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. So in this verse, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is being addressed regarding the hypocrites. And clearly Allah is highlighting that even if Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was to ask forgiveness of a hypocrite, they will not be forgiven. This is the punishment and this is the severe and the intense form of penalty which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran. Allahumma tawakhir kalbi min nifaqi wa amali min riyai And then in the verses 81 to 83, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be showing the behavior of the hypocrites and how Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the Muslims should respond to their excuses. <coughs> Those who remained behind rejoiced in their staying at home. That is, they were very happy. And they thought that the Muslims are going and they will be finished off and they will be destroyed and perished and none of them will come back after they fight with the Romans and we will have Medina for ourselves. They rejoiced in staying at home after the departure of Prophet ﷺ and disliked to strive with their wealth and their lives in the cause of Allah and said, do not go forth in the heat. Say, the fire of hell is more intense in heat if they would but understand. So let them laugh a little and then weep as much as recompense for what they used to earn. Verse 83, if Allah should return to you a faction of them. Now this, these verses and the remaining verses are those which were revealed when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was coming back after being victorious in the Tabuk expedition. And in all these verses following, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be guiding and instructing Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa how to behave and how to relate regarding these uh, hypocrites who will come out with their lame excuses. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has been said, if Allah should return you to a faction of them, whom? the hypocrites, after the expedition, and then they ask your permission to go out to a battle. That is, uh, seeing such a victory of Muslims this time, obviously when there would be uh, battles in future, the hypocrites in want of uh, worldly advantages of booty and everything, they might want to go and join the Muslim army again. So Allah is telling, uh, has told Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then ask your permission to go out to battle. Say, you will not go out with me ever and you will never fight with me an enemy. Indeed, you were satisfied with sitting at home at the first time. So sit now with those who stay behind and do not pray the funeral prayer O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over any of them who has died ever or stand at his grave. Indeed, they disbelieved in Allah and his messenger and died while they were defiantly disobedient. So here in this verse 84 uh, is what Allah is uh, ordering Prophet Wasallam not to pray for them, their funeral prayer, or do not even seek forgiveness for them. And this verse and these orders were actually uh, sent to Prophet Wasallam after the death of the leaders of hypocrites of Madhya that is Abdullah bin Ubay. And it was told that uh, Prophet should not uh, seek forgiveness for him. 
So we continuously can keep on understanding and relating the dislike of hypocrisy in the sight of Allah and the severe and intense punishment and penalties which have been uh, promised and mentioned for the hypocrites. And let not their wealth and their children impress you. Allah only intends to punish them through them in this world and that their soul should depart at death while they are disbelievers. And when a surah was revealed, enjoining them to believe in Allah and to fight with his messengers, those of wealth among them asked your permission to stay back and said, leave us to be with those who sit at home. They were satisfied to be with those who stay behind and their hearts were sealed over so they do not understand. But the messenger and those who believed with him fought with their wealth and their lives. Those will have all that is good and it is those who are the successful Allah has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers flow, wherein they will abide eternally. That is the greatest attainment. And those with excuses among the Bedouins came to be permitted to remain. And they who had lied to Allah and his messengers sat at home. They will strike those who disbelieved among them a painful punishment. Verse number 91, there is not upon the weak or upon the ill or upon those who do not find anything to spend any discomfort when they are sincere to Allah and his messenger. There is not upon the doers of good any cause for blame and Allah is forgiving and merciful. Now, till this verse, till here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has talked about the hypocrites, has criticized them, has warned them. These were the hypocrites who did not join the army without any genuine excuse. Allah was commenting on their behavior and the lame excuses. But now there were others also who did not go because of genuine reasons and because of genuine excuses. Here from in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about them. And he is announcing his mercy and forgiveness for all those who had a genuine reason and an excuse. And they provided, they provided that they were provided they had general reason, genuine reasons, but that also provided that they were genuinely and genuinely sincere to the cause. You see, because there may be a person who got exempted and who, who fell ill or he had any other genuine reason which developed and cropped up immediately in these days. But he is happy and he is relieved to be able to escape the hardships of the battle and the journey. But on the contrast, there is another person. There is another person who did develop a general, uh, a genuine cause, could have, um, could because of illness or because of anything. But not going made him extremely upset for not being able to join. And he kept on asking and he kept on encouraging others to join because he could not. So Allah is who? Allah is alimun bidhat is sudur. He is knowing of all what is in our hearts, in our minds. So, and he is the master of the day of judgment. So there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in this verse commenting that those who had a genuine excuse and with the excuse, they were sincere. Then they will be forgiven. And for them, there will be no blame and there will be no punishment and penalty nor is there blame upon those who, when they came to you, that you might give them mounts. You said, I can find nothing for you to write upon. They turn back while their eyes over flooded with tears out of grief that they could not find something to spend for the cause of Allah. So here, this is the second group with a genuine excuse that they wanted to join as Mujahideen. They wanted to accompany the army for the Tabuk expedition, but they did not have any rights. And since 
the journey was very long and it was very difficult the difficult terrains and was unknown as i've explained already so going without rides was like next to impossible there had been expeditions when their distances were short and comparatively the terrains were easier and less tougher where the companions walked by foot or when companions shared their rides like for was by badar also but here this was not possible so prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam refused them but they were sincerely desirous of jihad and they were sincerely wanting to go and they could not join but they were extremely upset and they were crying when they were asked to return so allah likes what allah is continuously having a sight on the intention behind the deed allah subhanahu wa taala what he appreciates and what he rewards the deed is is which is done with total sincerity and the greater is the sacrifice and the greater is the sincerity the greater is the reward for the bondsman also the cause for blame is only upon those who ask permission of you while they are rich they are satisfied and content to be with those who stay behind and allah has sealed over their hearts so they do not know verse 94 they will make excuses to you when you have returned to them say make no excuse never will we believe you allah has already informed us of your news and allah will observe your deeds and so will his messenger then will you be taken back to the nor of the unseen and the witness and he will inform you of what you used to do so the ones which were who were not forgiven are those who made false and lame uh, excuses and they had no sincere reasons not to join the army verse number 95 they will swear by allah to you when they return to them that you would leave them alone so leave them alone they are indeed evil their refuge is hell as recompense for what they had been earning so the liars they have to swear frequently to conceal uh, to conceal their failed um, false statements and their false behaviors and this was all false swearing telling lies coming up with lame excusing and coming up with uh, wrong uh, excuses this was all what this was the behavior of the hypocrites of medina they swear to you so that you might be satisfied with them but if you should be satisfied with them indeed allah is not satisfied with defiantly disobedient people whom the hypocrites the bedouins are stronger in disbelief and hypocrisy and more likely not to know the limits of what laws allah has revealed to his messengers and allah is knowing and wise and among the bedouins are some who consider what they spend as a loss and a fate and a wait for your turns of misfortune upon them will be a more misfortune of evil and allah is hearing and knowing but among the bedouins are some who believe in allah and the last day and consider what they spend as a means of nearness to allah and of obtaining invocations of the messenger unquestionably it is a means of nearness for them allah will admit them to his mercy indeed allah is forgiving and merciful and the first forerunners in faith among the muhajirin and the ansar are those who followed them with good conduct allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with him and he has prepared for them gardens beneath which rivers will flow wherein they will abide forever that is the greatest attainment and among those around you of bedouins are hypocrites and also from the people of medina they have become accustomed to hypocrisy you do not know them but we know them we will punish them twice in this world then they will be returned to a great punishment verse number 102 and 103 now this is explaining in these verses allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining a third group now let me revise again the first group 
were those who had no genuine excuse, but they were coming out with false excuses and lame excuses, and they were lying. And these were the people who were the hypocrites. And they had received here in these verses, the tidings of hellfire. The second group we just learned from the preceding verses were those who had genuine excuses uh, and they were sincerely desirous of joining and they were giving tidings of mercy and forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there was a third group. There was a third group of sincere companions, but they had no genuine excuse but because of various factors, they had stayed behind from the taboo expeditions. And after staying behind, unlike the hypocrites, they were upset and they were extremely, extremely disturbed and they were seeking forgiveness and they were asking for repentance. And it is the repentance of these sincere companions who just stayed behind without any rhyme or reason. And because of different factors, which I'll be mentioning inshallah, the seeking of repentance of these companions is what gives Surah Tawbah its name. So these were a total of uh, 10 companions, and they have been mentioned in two groups or two categories. The first category is Hazrat Abu Lubaba bin Abdul Munzir and his six companions. So a total of seven, Hazrat Abu Lubaba bin Abdul Munzir and his six companions. This is the first category, which has been mentioned in the verse number 102 and 103. And the second category was three companions, Hazrat Qab bin uh, Malik and his two companions. So in verse number 102 and 103, uh, it is regarding the first group that is Abu Lubaba bin Abu Munzir and his six companions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, and there are others who have acknowledged their sins. They had mixed a righteous deed when another that was a bad deed. Perhaps Allah will turn to them in forgiveness. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Take, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from their wealth a charity by which you purify them and cause them increase and invoke Allah's blessings upon them. Indeed, your invocations are reassurance for them and Allah is hearing and knowing. So this category of uh, Hazrat Abu Lubaba bin Abu Munzir and his six companions, they had embraced Islam Hazrat Abu Lubaba had embraced Islam at the occasion of the second pledge of Aqaba. And he had taken part in Battle of Badr and Uhud and most of the campaigns of uh, all the war expeditions by in the life of Prophet Sallallahu But for the Tabuk expedition, he just succumbed to an inner weakness and he just stayed back without any lawful excuse. And same was the case of his six companions. All of them were sincere Muslims. Now, after staying back, when they just looked around, they found either women or they found children or they found the old and the sick and the hypocrites. So when Prophet Wasallam, after victory on his way back, when he was coming back, they realized, they realized that what impression Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will develop about them. So they were filled with shame and they were regretful and they started seeking forgiveness. And they ordered, they requested their companions that they should be tied to the pillars of the mosque. And they vowed that they will stay sleepless. They would not sleep. They would stay sleepless and they will not eat and they will not drink till they are pardoned or till the time of their death. They did all this before they were called to explain their conduct. Before Prophet Sallallahu came to Medina and he asked them the reason why they had not gone. They, before all that, feeling shameful for their behavior, they did all this before they were called to explain about their conduct. And after some days, they being tied up to the columns and the pillars of the mosque, staying sleepless and without food or without drink. After some times they collapsed, they were unconscious because of the hunger and thirst. And at last these verses were revealed and uh, information was given that they have been forgiven. When they were open, they regained their consciousness. They were asked to open them and uh, they went to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
and they, all of them, they offered all their houses and their belongings, uh, which they thought and which they assumed had been responsible for the sin of omission. And they requested Prophet Sallallahu to accept all their uh, possessions. But Prophet Sallallahu said that there was no need to give away all the things. And he just suggested that one third should be sufficient. So the whole event and the whole narration makes us clear, makes us clear that what kind of sins with which behaviors are pardonable. Number one, that the person should not be a habitual offender or a defaulter. And the past conduct of the person should be based on sincerity. And the person should not invent or fabricate false explanations for the sin. And last but not the least, the person should confess and accept and regret and repent and seek forgiveness. So they also, they offered, we also learned this, that by offering uh, all their property and wealth and riches and spending charity in the path of, of Allah, when we are seeking forgiveness, it will become as the probability of atonement uh, further increases. So when we are seeking uh, forgiveness for atonement of our sins, we need to assist it by spending in the path of Allah and by making charity also. And um, in order to atone for one's sin, we need to give a practical, need to give a practical proof, which practical proof may be a verbal confession and a heartfelt regret. One way to, uh, to practically prove is to give charity. And this charity itself does what? It cleanses, it cleanses the heart of the filthy feelings and it cleanses the heart of the filth, which is being nourished in the heart. And this spending of charity will eradicate the hidden evils and it will increase the capacity of good work and righteous deeds. So a person committing sins is when he is falling in a sin, he finds it difficult to come out of it. The person is falling in a pit and he finds it difficult to come out of it. So physical effort by word of mouth calling out for help and by physical effort striving to come out of it and then spending charity in the path of Allah will help a bondsman come out of the pit of sin and spending charity in the path of Allah while seeking forgiveness will also be a source of atonement of the sins. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al mutatakhirin and that is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning in verse number 103. I read again, Allah says, take from their wealth a charity by which you purify them and cause them increase and invoke upon them. Indeed, your invocations are reassurance for them and Allah is hearing and knowing. Do they not know that it is Allah who accepts repentance from his servants and receives charities and that is, it is Allah who is the acceptance of uh, who is the accepting of repentance, the merciful, and say, do as you will, for Allah will see your deeds, and so will his messenger and the believers, and you will be returned to the knower of the unseen and the witness, and he will inform you of what you used to do. Verse number 106. And there are others deferred until the command of Allah, whether he will punish them or whether he will forgive them. And Allah is knowing and wise. So this verse 106 is explaining the case of the three people, Hazrat Qab bin Malik and his two companions, that it has been postponed, it was deferred, had it not been decided uh, in the eyes of Allah. That is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not decided whether they will be forgiven or not. And after a few verses, their case will be taken up again. Verse 107, and there are those, there are those hypocrites who took for themselves a mosque for causing harm and disbelief and division among the believers and as a station for whoever had warned warred against Allah and his messengers before, and they will surely swear we intend only the best. And Allah testifies that indeed they are the liars. 
Now in verse number 107 to 110, these verses are regarding a transgressor, a Fasik, Abu Amir, the transgressor, the Fasik. He was what? He was basically a Christian and a Christian scholar and he was a monk before he arrived, before Prophet Sallallahu arrived to Medina. And uh, this uh, Abu Amir, being a scholar, was taken as uh, a religious leader also. And he had a respect and position in Medina. But after Prophet Sallallahu arrived in Medina, he somehow, he lost his status in Medina. And from there, he became a rival to Prophet Sallallahu Abdullah bin Ubayi, we learn, was a political opponent of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Abu Amir, the monk, he was what? He was a religious opponent of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Abu Amir's son was Hazrat Hanzala, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And he has been given the title of Ghasile Malaika, the companion who was who was given a bath by the angels by water from the springs of Jannah. How could the son of such a transgressor be such a strong son, such a strong person of faith and belief? You know why? Because Hazrat Hanzala was one of the companions who was extremely sensitive about his faith and belief. And he was worried about any, any finest and minutest of signs of hypocrisy in his personality. There was one day when he came out crying and he was crying and he was, he was uh, loudly saying that Hanzala has turned a hypocrite. Hanzala has become a hypocrite. And Hazrat Abu, Hazrat Umar ta'ala and who came and he asked Hanzala, what is the matter? Why are you crying out and you are announcing that you've turned out to be a hypocrite? Hazrat Hanzala ta'ala and who said, that Umar, my, my level of Iman keeps on fluctuating. The level of my Iman keeps on fluctuating. In the gatherings of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my Iman and my level of Iman is very different. And it grossly decreases in my home. And Hazrat Umar realized that he also had the same state of affairs. So both of them, they were crying and they went to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they explained the situation. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam very lovingly and kindly he answered, Hanzala, Iman fluctuates. It keeps on increasing and decreasing. And look, if the level of your faith and if the level of your Iman, it stayed the same. It stayed the same as it was in my gatherings. It stayed the same at your home, at your, in your bed also. Then angels would descend and they would greet you. So this was... Hazrat Hanzala, who was the son of a transgressor of a Fasik, a religious opponent of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Amir. So remember, we can never justify ourselves in a wrong path just by saying that this is how we found our parents do, or this is what we've learned our parents do. If the son of Abu Amir could be Hazrat Hanzala, then the most of misguided and the most of unguided people could obviously have righteous, pious children. Allahumma ja'alla minhum. Now Abu Amir, uh, he, was, uh, he was, since he was a hypocrite, he gathered all the hypocrites and he decided to make a mosque in the suburbs of Medina. And the purpose and intention of making the center was that they, in, they were interested that the hypocrites of Medina, they don't have a center to do conspiracies against Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they made, they wanted to make a mosque in the suburbs of Medina with the intention of making a center where the hypocrites could get together and they could uh, make plans against the Muslims. And uh, he requested Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to inaugurate the mosque. And the purpose of all this was to prove the authenticity the authenticity of the mosque and to get an approval uh, and a go-ahead from Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself. 
And uh, Professor, they gave the excuse when they were asked that why, despite the fact that there was already a mosque in Medina, the mosque of Nabawi, then why did they need to go ahead with making another mosque? And they gave the excuse that since the Muslim population of Medina was increasing and people uh, from far off of Medina, they were finding difficult to read the Masjid Nabi, then it will facilitate all those people away, far off from the Masjid Nabi, to enter for the congregational salah for people from far off in the center. So, Prophet وسلم, was obviously, he didn't know their intentions. And uh, he agreed to inaugurate the mosque after he returned from the Tabuk expedition. And when he was on his way back, these verses, they were revealed. And the true picture of why the mosque, the mosque was intended to be built. And this was, mosque was called as the masjid e zarar And uh, Prophet Wasallam was told the whole picture and uh, he was ordered to demolish it. So Prophet Sallallahu sent his companions to demolish the mosque. What lessons do we learn is, actions depend on what? Intentions. We can, we can definitely see that a deed, a deed which was as pious as the construction of a mosque, construction of the mosque, which has been reported in traditions of Prophet Sallallahu that he said that whoever constructs a mosque Whoever constructs a mosque, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will construct a similar palace for him in Jannah. But even if the mosque was constructed and planned with, in, with intention of malice and corruption, then with all these negative activities, it will not be accepted. It will not be accepted and will not be a source of reward. So we clearly understand the importance of intention and we also understand from here the dislike of malice and mischief. And regarding this uh, mosque, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is explaining and narrating the whole event and guiding Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa what to do and what not to do. Allah says, do not stand for prayer within it. Ever a mosque founded on righteousness from the first day is more worthy for you to stand in. Within it are men who love to purify themselves. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al -mutatuqireen. Within it are men who love to purify themselves and Allah loves those who purify themselves. Then is the one who laid the foundation of his building on righteousness with fear from Allah and seeking his approval better or the one who laid the foundation of his building on the edge of a bank about to collapse. So it collapsed with him into the fire of hell and Allah does not guide the wrongdoing people. Verse number 110, their building which they built, who? Abu Amir Fasik and all the transgressors and all the hypocrites they built with the, with the intention of corruption and malice. Their building which they build will not cease to be a cause of skepticism in their heart until their hearts are stopped and Allah is knowing and wise. Verse 111. Allah says, indeed, Allah has purchased from the believers their lives and their properties in exchange of that they will have paradise. Inna Allah hashtara min al -mu'minina. A purchase, a transaction, a trade, a barter, which is taking place between the creator, the sustainer, and his bondsman. What are their trades? Allah explains, they fight in the cause of Allah, so they kill and they are killed. It is a true promise binding upon him in Torah and in Injil and the Quran. And who is truer to his covenant than Allah? So rejoice in your transaction, which you have contracted. And it is that which is the great attainment. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing a transaction, a trade, a business dealing between Allah and his bondsmen. You know what the reality and actual state of affairs is? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created his jannah. 
as Allah mentions in Quran, Nuzulum mir Rabbil Alameen. Nuzulum means what? Nuzulum in Arabic means and refers to a hospitality the host has prepared before the arrival of the host, before the arrival of the guest. So Allah says, Jannah is what? It is a hospitality from the leader, from the sustainer of the worlds before the inmates of the hell of the Jannah have arrived there. So he has created a Jannah and he is now offering a barter, a trade for the bondsmen. He says what? I have given you life and I have given you the wealth and the riches and the properties and you do what? You trade with me for Jannah and you return a part of your life, a part of your time, a part of your efforts, a part of your struggle and a part of your wealth and riches and you trade with me for Jannah. Give both it's not, it's like, it's not like actual buying and selling, you know, in the worldly sense. Means what? It means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all of us and ordering all the bondsmen to do what? Surrender yourself. Surrender yourself to the obedience and you spend your properties in the path of Allah to trade for Jannah. Now, let's all think and imagine, do we want to be the traders for Jannah? Now see for yourself, look around, you have both, you have riches, you have life. Yes, we do have, alhamdulillah. Allah, make us obedient, make us obedient servants of Allah and help us surrender and help us submit and help us, help us spend in the path of Allah and help us surrender our wills and desires to trade for Jannah. Rabbibni li a'indaka baitan fil Jannah. And in the next verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to explain and relate the traits of all those believers and bondsmen who trade with Allah, spending their, spending their lives and efforts and struggles, and also their money and wealth in the path of Allah. So what are they like? Some traits of these believers who are the traders for Jannah. Such believers are, number one, they are repentant. So the first trait is atta ibuna, those who repent. Because obviously, when they default, when they, when they sin, and when they default in their obedience, in their deal with Allah for Jannah, they regret, they repent, and they try to undo. Then the second trait is the worshippers. They are al-abidun, they obey, they worship with whom, with Allah, they have traded with. Then is they, they are the praisers of Allah, al-hamidun. They praise the one who has offered such a remarkable and a splendid deed to trade for Jannah. And then they do what? They are al-hamidun and they are the travelers. They are the travelers for his cause. as they go around and they introduce, they introduce to the bondsmen with whom they want all of them to be the traders of Allah. And they do what? They bow and prostrate in prayers. Those who enjoin what is right and forbid what is wrong. And those who observe the limits set by Allah. Because obviously they are trading with Allah for Jannah and give good tidings to the believers. It is not for the Prophet and those who have believed to ask forgiveness for the polytheists, even if they were relatives, after it has become clear to them that they are the companions of hellfire. Allahumma la taj'alna minhum. And the request of forgiveness of Ibrahim for his father was only because of a promise. Because of a promise he had made to him, but when it became apparent to Ibrahim salam, that his father was an enemy to Allah, he disassociated himself from him. Indeed, was Ibrahim salam compassionate and patient. And Allah would not let a people stray after he has guided them until he makes clear to them what they should avoid. Indeed, Allah is knowing of all the things. Indeed, to Allah belongs the dominion of heavens and the earth. He gives life and causes death. And you have not besides Allah any protector or 
any helper. Allah has already forgiven the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Muhajireen and the Ansar who followed him in the hour of difficulty after the hearts of a party of them had almost inclined to doubt and then he forgave them. Indeed, he was to them kind and merciful. Verse 118, and he also forgave the three. Now is coming the narration of the forgiveness of the three companions whose case was postponed and the decision was deferred in the previous verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had announced the forgiveness of uh, the seven companions, that is Hazrat Abu Lubaba bin Abul Munzir and the six companions. So now here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the forgiveness of the three, that is Hazrat Qab bin Malik and his two companions. He also forgave the three who were left behind and regretted their errors. So Allah forgives whom? Who regret and repent to the point that earth closed in on them in spite of its vastness and their souls confined them and they were certain that there is no refuge from Allah except in him. Then he turned to them so that they could repent. Indeed, Allah is the accepting of repentance, the merciful. So from now here, Allah is explaining the condition. This verse is explaining the condition of the three believers whose, uh, whose repentance is being accepted. The three being Hazrat Qab bin Malik, Hazrat Hilal bin Umayya, and Hazrat Murara bin Rabi. They were sincere companions of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they had made sacrifices, and they had given solid proofs of their sincerity before this occasion. And uh, they had, most of them, all three of them, they had accompanied Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in every other expedition. Now, what happened here and what went wrong here, they themselves narrate that what the reasons of uh, their defaulting from joining the, uh, the army for the, uh, for the Tabuk expedition were. Hazrat Hilal bin Umayya, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he explains, he explained that his family had emigrated from Mecca and they had shifted to various parts, some of them going to Medina and some of them going to Habsha. So they had shifted and they had scattered and they had separated to various parts. Now for the first time, now for the first time since their emigration from Mecca to different parts of the land, after a long period, they had all gathered together in Medina. So this was what? This was the temptation for the family time. The temptation for staying with the family in the family time is what overpowered them. This is exactly all of the behavior of all these three companions is a total translation and explanation of the words we just went through in Surah Tawbah where Allah said, well, in kana abaukum wa that these five initial factors turned out to be the deterrents for Hazrat Hilal bin Umayya and he stayed back from the Tabuk expedition and joined in his behavior like very much like the hypocrites. The second was Hazrat Murara bin Rabi. He explains the cause that he said that I had two wives and I had two orchards of palm trees and within them were my two houses and they were cool and they were shady and they were extremely comfortable with all forms of daily luxuries in them. And so what was the factor which stopped him was the love of his wives and the desire to keep on enjoying the comforts and the luxuries of his comfortable house and moreover, to be mindful and to be careful about his agriculture, his palm trees, which were full of bunches of ripe dates. So it was the added layer of his home also which stopped him. So these were the factors for the two. Now, what the matter for Hazrat Kaab bin Malik was, in fact, he has narrated the whole story in detail. He said that I had absolutely no issue. 
And there was no problem. I was in good health and I was economically sound and I had horses. And I told myself that I will definitely join like I had been in the previous expeditions. But you know what? He kept on postponing and delaying. This postponing the work of today, this postponing and delaying it for tomorrow is what turned out to be the actual deterring factor for him. Now he kept on postponing and telling himself that, okay, I will definitely join and I have all the resources and manners and all the affordability to join and I will join. But he kept on postponing till he heard that the army had left. And he said that Shaitan told me that your horses are like one of the very fast horses and you will be easily able to join tomorrow also. So he postponed it till tomorrow. When the next day came, he developed a feeling and that was all being like lazy and it was all like postponing the work of today for tomorrow. And then he thought that I know the route to Tabuk and I have been frequently on that route also. So the army, they will not be able to cover the route as quickly as I can. So I can still delay today and I can join tomorrow. So then there was a third day and uh, he again himself justified his laziness and postponed again till the next day. He told himself that he knew a shortcut as well and he can still delay for another day. But on the fourth day, there was Shaitan. There was Shaitan who had been constantly, constantly uh, instilling and infusing all forms of these things in his heart. Now on the fourth day, Shaitan told him that now, now joining the army or joining all of them like seemed like next to impossible and you will not be able to catch up now. They must have reached quite far off. So it's better for you to stay back. What was this all about? It was laziness, delaying and postponement without any logical rhyme or reason. That is why Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us the supplication which we need to recite very frequently. Allahumma inni a'uzu bika min al-hammi wal-khuzni wa a'uzu bika min al-ajzi wal-qasli. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stay away from any form of postponements and any forms of lazy behavior in our lives. So now what he said was that when I stayed back, when I stayed back, I would look and Prophet Sallallahu when the companions left for the Tabuk expedition, I was just, um, I used to look behind and I used to look over and over again around myself to the people who had stayed behind in Medina. They were all the women and they were the children. They were the old, the sick, the debilitated people who were justified in their excuses or they were the hypocrites. So when uh, he thought that I used to feel very upset, but what happened was that unlike the other seven companions, they did not do what the other seven companions did. What happened was when Holy Prophet came, uh, Prophet Salavaisim, he came back to Tabuk. He, as is usual, he said two rakats of prayer in the mosque, and then he sat down there to meet the people. So at first, the hypocrites, whose uh, number has been explained as a little more than 80, they came to Prophet Sallallahu and they offered lame excuses with their um, solemn oaths to make themselves, to cover themselves up and to justify and they prove how truthful they were. And Holy Prophet Sallallahu silently kept on listening to their false stories and to each of them. And um, he just kept quiet and he left the decision about what their mannerism is going to be uh, to Allah. And to some, he also added that may Allah forgive you. So then he said that Hazrat Kaab said that this, then finally the turn came up to me and uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when I came up, and it was my turn. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked me, well, what kept you behind? What kept you behind? You know what? Because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could not, could not imagine that such a sincere companion could stay behind also. So he said that I hesitated for a moment. But then he says that by God, I would have invented any excuse any excuse or the other to satisfy any man of the world for I was well versed in the art of conversation. But he knew that there was Prophet Sallallahu who, who was demanding an explanation. And he said that, I believe that even if I succeeded, even if I succeeded in satisfying him by making a false excuse, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will inform him of the truth. And 
I shall, I shall again incur another displeasure of Allah. And then he realized that on the other hand, if I tell the truth and I come out with truth and no lies and no lame excuses, he thought that I, I can expect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me, even though, even though I was to incur displeasure for the time being, that for the time being, I will displease Prophet Wasallam. But in the long run, he was sure that if I come out with the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive me. So Hazrat Kaab said what? He said, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I have no excuse for staying behind. I was in every way able to go forth to Tabuk. And at this, Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remarked that this is a man who has told the truth. And he turned to me and said, go, go back and wait till Allah decides your case. And he rose from there and uh, he took away. He came back to his house. And after a few days, it was announced that all the people from Mecca, they were, it, a general order was issued that the people of Mecca, they will not communicate with us. They will not relate and interact or talk with any one of these three. So it was a very difficult order. And moreover yet, Hazrat Kaab bin Malik also explains that when he came back from his seat in front of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he came back to the people of his tribe and his family, they, they uh, mocked him and they said that all of them were giving excuses. You could have made an excuse also, but Hazrat uh, Qab bin Malik said that I had done an evil deed once and I had defaulted once and I had committed a sins to displease Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once, I would not do that again to displease them for the second time. I would not commit the second sin again. So he felt like he was very satisfied to stick to the truth. And then when after a few days, a general order was issued that no one was supposed to talk to them or socially interact with them. And uh, there Hazrat Qab bin Malik who said that uh, the other two companions, Hazrat Hilal bin Umayya and Hazrat Murara bin Rabi, they confined themselves to their houses. But he said that I used to go out of my house and I used to stay, say prayers in the congregation also. And uh, I used to walk in the markets also, but nobody used to speak to me. And uh, he also explained that when I used to go to the mosque, I used to greet Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and say Assalamu Alaikum, but that was in vain. There used to be no response. There used to be no answering back by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he also said that when I used to be offer, I used to offer my Salah, I used to feel that uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was looking at me. But when I looked back at him after saying Salam of the Salah, he used to turn his eyes from me. And this was heartbreaking for him. This was actually heartbreaking for him. That Prophet Sallallahu not answering his salam and Prophet Sallallahu not replying to him and Prophet Sallallahu turning his eyes away from him. This was actually heartbreaking for him. And he explains that one day when the situation became extremely intolerable for me, then I went to one of my paternal cousins, Abu Qatada, and he was a friend of childhood and he was a cousin to me. And I called out to him and I climbed over a wall of his garden and I uttered uh, greetings to him and I said salam to him, but he did not respond. Because why? They were doing exactly what they were ordered. And we can see the extent of discipline and obedience in the whole of the society. When ordered that you're not going to greet, when ordered when you're not going to relate, even the closest of relatives were obeying. So this is when the love of Allah and with the desire to please Allah and Prophet Sallallahu exceeds the desire to please the relations of kin even. So he did not even answer back and he did not even interact or relate with him. And uh, Hazrat uh, Kaab said that I asked, I called out and he said, Oh, Abu Qatada, I ask you to tell me that do I love Allah and his messengers? And then he again remained silent and he urged him to keep answering, answering what he was asking and all what he had to say that I don't know Allah and his messenger. Prophet Sallallahu knows. And then he says, when I saw this behavior, even from my friend of childhood and from my cousin, my eyes filled with tear and I, I just came back. And he says that when I was walking back in the street towards my house, there was another trial. There was another trial which was put on me. And the trial was what? That he received a letter. And this letter was what? 
he said that this was a letter uh, from Syria and it was from the king of Ghassan. And it read what, as Atab bin Malik says, that it was written in the letter that uh, the king of Ghassan had invited him. And he had said that we have come to know that your Lord is, that your Lord, that is your leader is persecuting you these days. And uh, you are not a person who should be ignored. And we will not leave you to rot there. And so he invited him to say what? Therefore, you come to us and we will honor you as you deserve. This was a trial. As Atkab said that I told myself that this is another hard trial for me. And what he did was he, he burnt the letter in an oven. So the boycott, as Atkab says, the boycott lasted for 40 days. And then he says that I was on the, on the 50th day because the whole of the uh, Tabuk expedition had taken all that long. So he said that on the 50th day, when after my Fajr prayer, I was sitting in a state of total uh, despair and disappointment, and I was very anxious and upset on the top of my house. Then all of a sudden, I saw people running towards my house. And all of a sudden, I heard a person tell me, O Kaab bin Malik, accept my con uh, congratulations. And hearing them, I fell to prostration. I felt and I prostrated on the ground before Allah. And I understood that the command of Allah for my forgiveness had come. And then people kept on coming. And he said, the first person to congratulate me, I took off my shirt and gave it off as a charity. That was the only thing he had ready at hand to give a charity that time. And then he said that I, I went running to the mosque and there I saw Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I noticed that the face of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was glowing. It was glowing with happiness in response to um, the salam of Prophet of Hazrat Kaab. He replied back and he was so happy and he embraced him. And he said, I congratulate you, O Kaab, on this. It is the best day of your life. Remember, remember the best day of our lives is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts our forgiveness, accepts our repentance, when all our sins are forgiven is the best day of our lives. Prophet said, Kaab, it is the best day of, our li of your life. And the Kaab asked that, is this forgiveness from you or is it from Allah? And then Prophet added, no, it is from Allah. And then he recited these verses, verses 117 and 118. And then immediately Hazrat Qab who said that I offered that O Messenger of Allah, does my repentance, it require that I should give the whole of my property in charity? And Prophet said that no, keep a part of it and um, uh, do uh, give away in charity the rest of it, but keep a part of it for yourself. It will be good for you. And I kept my property of Khaybar for myself and gave the rest for charity. And then Hazrat uh, Kaab said that I solemnly pledged that I will seek, I will stick to the truth throughout the rest of my life. For Allah had forgiven me in return for the truth which I had told. And that is why he said that that is why I never uttered a word, word against the reality. And intentionally, I lived up to my truth the whole of my life. And he said that, I hope and expect that Allah will protect me from what lies in future of hellfire also because of my sting, my clicking and my clinging and sticking to the truthfulness in my life. So this is the story of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgave the three companions also. Oh, you who have believed, fear Allah and be with those who are true. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. It was not proper for the people of Medina and those surrounding them out of Bedouins that they remained behind after the departure of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah says that it was not proper for the people of Medina and those surrounding them of the Bedouins that they remained behind after the departure of Messenger of Allah, 
or that they preferred themselves over his self, that is, because they are not afflicted by thirst or fatigue or hunger in the cause of Allah, nor do they tread on any ground that enrages the disbelievers, nor do they inflict upon an enemy any infliction, but there is registered for them as a righteous deed. Indeed, Allah does not allow to be lost the reward of the doers of good nor do they spend an expenditure small or large or cross a valley but that is registered for them that allah may reward them for the best of what they are doing verse number 122 and it is not for the believers to go forth to battle all at once for they should separate from every division of them a group remaining to obtain understanding in religion and warn their people when they return to them that they might be cautious now what is Allah mentioning and ordering here is a specific manner of teaching and preaching of Quran. Because you know that after the Tabuk expedition, the malice and the corruption of the hypocrites had come out openly, like they were being, they had the audacity enough to plan for the assassination of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So their corruption had come out openly. So now to prevent the Muslim state from all these negative activities of the hypocrites, what was needed was an extensive program of teaching and educating of Quran to create awareness to, to take away all forms of hypocrisy. Now, so in this verse, number 122, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has suggested the steps and the systems of preaching and the systems and manners of Dawa. Allah says that it is not mandatory, that it is not obligatory or needed that all the believers come out for Dawa. Because do you remember Islam is a very practical religion. In, in a Muslim state, some people have to be doing various jobs. For example, we need to have teachers in the schools, in the colleges, in the universities. We need doctors for the hospitals. We need engineers in the factories. We need lawyers in the courts. So all the people coming out for the purpose and for the activity of Dawa is not what is needed because they need to run the activities in the different spheres of life, in the different fields of life of the society. So for all, Dawa is not obligatory and it's not mandatory. Although Prophet وسلم, has definitely told all of us that the best of you is he who learns the Quran and teaches it to other. But what is needed is regarding dawah and preaching and teaching of Quran is that few of the people, a few of the bondsmen need to come out for this task. From where? From from different sects and from different factions and from different from various cities from various localities from colonies and from different fields of life from different spheres of life from different parts of the country from different parts of the cities from different localities of the cities or certain doctors or certain engineers certain lawyers from different spheres of life coming out and doing what getting to specialized centers of religious education by religious scholars, by religious teachers. And why would they need to do all that? So they get a comprehensive and a deep-rooted understanding of the teachings of Quran, Hadith, and Sunnah. A comprehensive and a deep-rooted understanding of religion they acquire from these specialized centers, having learned religious scholars. And then equipping themselves with this religious knowledge, equipping themselves with this religious knowledge, they would do what? They would return towards their areas. They would return towards their areas, towards their cities, towards their localities, towards their communities, towards their tribes, and towards their 
subordinates and towards their affairs of life. And there they would be doing what? They would create awareness and they would create piety and they would warn their people of being misguided and of a sinful life pattern. They would create awareness in the people of their nation. And why would they need to do this? So that the people would get God-fearing and they would save themselves from going astray and they would save themselves from the punishments of hell fire. O oh, you, O oh, you who have believed, fight those addition to you of the disbelievers and let them find in you harshness and know that Allah is with the righteous. And whenever a surah is revealed, there are among the hypocrites who say, which of you has increased in faith? As for those who believe, it has increased them in faith while they are rejoicing. But as for those in whose hearts is disease, it has only increased them in evil in addition to their evil, and they will have died while they are disbelievers. Do they not see that they are tried every year once or twice, but then they do not repent, nor do they remember and whenever a surah is revealed, they look at each other saying, does anyone see you? And then they dismiss themselves. Allah has dismissed their hearts because they are the people who do not understand. There, are, uh, there has certainly come to you a messenger from among yourself. Grievous to him is what you suffer. He is concerned over you and to the believers is kind and merciful. Verse 20, 129. But if they turn away, say, Hasbi Allah, la ilaha illahu, alayhi tawakkaltu wa huwa rabbul arshil azim. Sufficient for me is Allah. There is no deity except him on him i have relied and he is the lord of the great throne so the last words of surah toba of this chapter is doing what is motivating for jihad in the path of allah and for struggling and striving for jihad in the path of allah we need what we need time and we need reliance on Allah. So the message of reliance is from the last verse. And Prophet Wasallam, regarding the time which is needed for struggling of jihad, Prophet Wasallam has promised regarding this verse that if someone recites this last verse of Surah Tawbah every morning and every evening seven times, then that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will promise, will promise blessing him with the barqa in his time and makes the job of the day easy also. وانصرهم على عذوبك وعذوبهم اللهم لعن القثرة الذين يصدون عن سبيلك ويقذبون رسلك ويقاتلون أولياءك اللهم خالف بين قلمتهم وزلزل أقدامهم وأنزل بهم بأسق الذي لا تردوه عن القوم المجرمين Rabbana la tuzih qulubana ba'da isqadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahab subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al mursalin walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin amin summa amin